this um, the YouTube screen here just to make sure I get all the comments. And there's always like a little bit of a two minute delay. So just give me a, a minute or two to always answer all your questions. But let's first go over, um, let's see, what's Harriet have? Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so everything sounds good. So let's talk about like, like what I'm gonna cover today. We're gonna go over like my new intimate fasting and workout program that I'm gonna follow now for the next eight weeks. And I did this about two months ago. So I'm gonna kinda, kinda, kinda reference that and talk about like the pros and cons, how well it went, and then I'll kind of transition into what I'm doing now. Let's see, James, oh, James is here too. Perfect sound, perfect picture from California, fantastic. That's great, so let me, let's go, so let me, let me recap this whole thing. So the main goal um, of this new program is to maintain my muscle mass, because I tried to put on a little bit of muscle over the, next, over the past eight weeks, and I wanna lower my body fat. So we'll go over my whole workout that I'm gonna do now, the whole schedule, my whole intermittent fasting schedule I'm gonna follow, and then at the end, we'll go over some exact like meal examples like I always I always like to do. So first we'll recap, you know, I, I made a little, I kinda like starting out like this now, I made a little recap of, um, of what we're gonna do in this live stream. And then I'll go over the new diet program, the new workout program, then we'll give exact like meal examples, and we'll do a Q and A at the end, and we'll do a Q and A during the whole thing. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't realize I always seem to have a live Mac. Like setting this whole thing up, I like I bent over and kind of tweaked my back a little bit right before we started. But I'm feeling pretty good. Well, we'll let's see how this whole thing goes. Okay. Let's see. So the first thing, let, let's just go over like what I just ended last week. Like like my whole goal about eight weeks ago is this, this whole thought process that I'm actually turning 60 at the end of August. So I wanna, I mean, I generally do this for every one of my birthdays. I try to get my body fat levels like a little extra low, take some pictures, like I like kind of document this whole fitness journey that I've been on, you know, my entire life. Uh, last year I kind of messed up with COVID and I, I felt like I didn't achieve the goals that I wanted to when I turned 59, so I'm really gonna try to do it this year. So the initial, initi and, and I, I, I'm hoping you're learning from my own experiences, obviously, that's why I'm doing this live stream. So you can follow my, follow my lead if you wanna do this, all these different strategies, um, all these different strategies along with me. So what I decided to do about eight weeks ago, I said, okay, I'm gonna go into a positive energy balance and I'm gonna try to get stronger, I'm gonna try to put on a little bit of muscle. And then after that eight week cycle, which I'm, which I'm at this point now, then I'm gonna start reducing my calories, I'm gonna start cu like cutting back for eight weeks. So that's kind of where I am now. So the initial goal eight weeks ago was to gain muscle, to be in a positive energy balance. And if you don't know what I mean by po positive energy balance, that just means that I'm eating more calories than maintenance calories, right? Or when you're in a calorie deficit, you're losing weight. When you're eating maintenance calories, you're at equilibrium. That means you're not gaining, you're not losing, you're just maintaining your weight. And then when you take in more calories, you're in a positive energy balance. So you're gaining weight, or hopefully in my case, I wanted to gain muscle, right? So I was gaining muscle, right? I also wanted to increase my workout volume. That's one way of, make, that's one way of making the workout harder. So I was working out more than I typically would, like doing more sets and more resistance training sets, things like that. I wanted to get stronger. That's one of the biggest indicators if you're putting on more muscle, if you're getting stronger. I also wanted to work out hard. I kind of wanted to go for it because I haven't gone for it in the, in, in the gym for a while. And then I also wanted to minimize the amount of body fat I put on because generally whenever you're in a positive energy balance, and I can know the ultimate goal is just to put on muscle, it's almost impossible to only gain muscle, you're probably gonna gain a little bit of body fat. And that's just pretty much what happens, right? So this was the overall, I say result, I would say from the whole process. I did gain about four or five pounds. Right? Now it's really hard to say, like was it all muscle? I'm sure it wasn't because I felt like my body fat, I felt like I looked a little heavier. But I think I probably gained about two, three pounds of muscle over an eight week period, which is I think was pretty good. There's no question about it. I definitely got stronger. But I, I made a little note here because I started taking creatine when I started this whole cycle eight weeks ago. And not only will creatine make you stronger, it also makes you hold water. I talked about creatine before. It's probably the, probably the most studied or definitely the best muscle building or like athletic performance type supplement by far. You know, um, how it works is that when you take it, your body um, stores it in the muscle. Like all muscle contractions fueled by ATP, anisin triphosphate. 
and you can store about five to seven seconds of ATP, like right in the muscle cell right there. So I talked about this before. So for example, you can like hold your breath, not do anything. You can pick something up really heavy, and the first five to seven seconds is gonna be fueled by that store of ATP. But the second energy system is that that creatine phase, where creatine, that store within the muscle, helps make ATP. Because when you use up that stored ATP, you're left with ADP, anything diphosphate. So you gotta pick up a, a creatine molecule. So the fact that I took creatine, that definitely made me stronger. I was taking about 2.5 grams a day. And also, the more creatine you store in the muscle, it volumizes the muscle cell, the more water you hold. So that whole eight week cycle, I was taking creatine. So it's, it's hard to say, was it the creatine that made me stronger? Was it the creatine that maybe put on two, three pounds, four, five, you know? I think it was a combination of all things. I think I did get strong. I think I did put on a couple pounds of muscle. I did gain four or five pounds. So I'm sure I put on a little bit of water weight from the creatine. And I also think that I did put on a little bit of body fat. And I just looked at my abs. I don't see my abs, you know, quite as well. But overall, I think it was a pretty successful experiment and a successful eight weeks. And I do feel stronger. Some of the down, let me, let's talk about some of the downsides. Some of the downsides is, and I, I've been doing this um, my entire life, I think the most important thing, the most difficult thing for most people to do when they're working out, especially when it comes to rehab, or just working out in general, is to truly understand exercise progression. And I like the term micro-progress. I kind of like jumped into this like harder training and working out harder and doing more volume, in my opinion, too quickly and I've done this my whole life. I mean, I'm the type of person I, I have to hold myself back. There's tons of clients that come to me and sometimes I have to hold them back. Let's see what James got. James, Mike, I've been taking creatine also. It's been one, it's been a, a wondering how long it lasts in your muscles when you stop taking it. It's kind of interesting. I think it, it also depends on how much creatine you're actually eating. So it's a mole, creatine is like a molecule that the body makes on its own, right? But it's also, taken out from food, like they say, I think it's about a kilogram, 2.2 pounds of red meat is equivalent to about five grams of creatine. So a big part of it, James, I would say is a combination of how much like red meat, how much chicken too, but I think it's three pounds of chicken is about five grams. You know, salmon, fish, that's all has high amounts of, of, of creatine in it and your body is making some of it. So it's a combination, so it's hard to say. I think if you would say you were taking it two and a half, five grams a day, I think within a week or two, I, your levels will definitely be decreased, no question about it. And you'll see it. When you started taking it, you probably gained two, three pounds. And once you lose those two, three pounds, and it just seems like it's water weight, you know that the creatine is out of your system from the supplement. But you're still getting it. You're still getting it from food. That's why vegetarians, vegans do incredibly well when they take creatine because they're not eating meat. They're not getting the creatine from their diet. And it's another reason why you'll see when I get to the next slide and we start talking about my new program, I stop, I'm going to stop taking creatine. And people don't talk about this too much, but I think anything, anything that your body makes on its own, even like melatonin, right? You know, the hormone that helps you sleep at night. When, when darkness hits, the body, produce, the brain produces melatonin. If you're constantly taking melatonin or you're constantly taking a creatine type supplement, I always feel that maybe your body doesn't feel like it has to make it. I know there isn't that much scientific research on this. And I feel I like to cycle all these things. So if I'll do creatine for eight weeks, I'll go off it, you know, for a month or two. So I'm going to go off it now for the next eight weeks, but we'll talk about that more in the next slide. So unfortunately, I feel like I, I once again, I didn't go, I didn't micro progress. I just hit the weights a little too hard, a little too quickly. And a couple of old injuries started popping up. You know, over my life, I used to be a big windsurfer. I, I got like tendonitis in my elbows. Tendonitis to me is like, it's like tendinopathy. Some people say tendonitis, some people say tendinosis. Tendinosis is where you have little holes in the tendon. You just did inflammation in the tendon, kind of like, you know, like tennis elbow or thrower's elbow. My elbow started aching a little bit and, you know, after a couple of weeks of just hitting the weights too hard. You know, also, you may have, I mean, just like I tweaked my back right before I started this thing, I got a whole bunch of herniated disc in my neck and my back. So I do have to be a little careful with my back. And I didn't really hurt, hurt my back during the eight weeks, but I kind of was doing RDLs, those Romanian deadlifts. I kind of tweaked my back there one day. And then we all know about my knee. I got this bad knee. So I feel like I kind of pushed a little too hard. The next time I'm going to do an eight-week phase like this, I'm probably going to maybe do a, more of like a 12-week phase. I'm going to kind of ease into it. And I've always had a problem where like, 
if I say I'm gonna do something, or I say I'm gonna follow a particular program, I follow it no matter what. And you know, you really shouldn't do that. I'm gonna talk about that later in this presentation too. Like for example, if I tweak my elbows, I probably should have just reduced the volume and just slowed the whole process down and just micro progressed. And that's where I'm really gonna really make a note to myself to do that in the future. And I'm even gonna talk about it on this new program. I'm gonna throw in like active walk days whenever I feel like I need a day. So that was one negative for sure, but I'm feeling pretty good now, I have to say. Um, I feel like, like, like I said, I feel like I pushed too hard. I also feel like maybe I gained a little too much body fat. You know, maybe I didn't really have to do certain things. And I'm gonna talk about it. Like for example, I probably shouldn't have been taking the beetroot juice because it's so high in calories as a pre-workout drink, even though it does help exercise performance. Maybe I should have went with a powder. Would have been like, you know, 80, 90 less calories. You know, little things like that. And I feel like I just started hit, I started getting hungry a little too much. And once I started upping my carbs, I started getting hungry and I feel like maybe I took too many supplements in general um, over that, that whole process. But overall, I say it was a success for sure. Okay, so let's go into, this is more, more like kind of like the fun part. Let's go into the, like the new diet plan of what I'm gonna follow. If you have any questions, um, let me know. So so now over the, I already, I already started kind of doing this um, this past week. So over the next eight weeks, I definitely want to be in a calorie deficit. And I'm going to cycle my calories. Meaning that, and I think that's the best way to do it. And you may have heard like calorie cycling or carb cycling. Cycling calories just means that some days you eat more and other days you eat less. And in my opinion, that's a great way of restricting calories while minimizing the slowdown in your metabolism. I'm going to talk about this all the time. It's called metabolic adaptation. Whenever you lose weight and you become smaller, your metabolism slows down. And it's a good and it's a normal thing. It was that people would, you would just disappear, right? You shrink down to nothing. But you can over-exaggerate the slowdown in your metabolism by restricting calories too aggressively, doing it too often, or too staying in a calorie-restricted state for an extended period of time. So you can over-exaggerate over that. But by cycling your calories, being like one day eat maintenance calories or maybe a little above, the next day go on a calorie deficit, you get you get the best of both worlds. You'll get a little bit of slowdown in your metabolism, but in my opinion, nowhere near as, mu as much. Plus, you make sure you're getting in your vitamins, minerals, and nutrients by cycling your calories. Let's see, okay, we got a question. Hey, Mike, um, so I'm going to start fasting. It's Is 40 hours a good aim, aiming to lose around 10 to 15 pounds? You know, you could do that. I think that's pretty aggressive, though, like jumping into um, a straight-up 48-hour fast. If you feel like you can do it, give it a shot. I probably would do something a little more conservative. Definitely start with like a 24 hour fast, maybe once a week or twice a week, or maybe an OMAD where you're fasting for 23 hours, taking all your calories at one hour. I would probably do that. You know, I, it, a lot of it, um, Juicy, is like where you're coming from. If you're already eating like a relatively low carb diet and, you know, and you feel like you're not hungry, but if, if you're just looking to hit it hard, and lose 10, 15 pounds with a 48 hour fast, maybe once or twice a week, I think it's gonna be really challenging. Not that it's bad, but it's challenging. I would probably would do one of these easier strategies, even just like an 18-6, a 16-8, a 24 hour fast, a nomad. Do that for a few weeks, feel this whole thing out, and then maybe try a 48 hour fast. Truthfully, I, I didn't do 48 hour fast for years. And I recently, recently did my first three day fast and I found the last day really challenging. I did a live stream on it. I really love the 16-8, the 18-6, a 24-hour fast, a nomad. I think those are, those are much more reasonable long-term type strategies to do. But, but give it a shot. If you do do it, leave some comments. I'd, I would love to know, you know, how, you know how, how, how you get along with it for sure. Okay, so I'm going to go into a calorie deficit cycling my calories. Some days I'll eat more, some days I'll eat less. Okay, now like I talked about earlier, I'm definitely going to eliminate like the beet juice because eight ounces of beet juice is 100 calories. And the reason why I was taking beet juice for the eight week cycle when I wanted to put on muscle is first of all, I want a good performance in the gym. See, beets are naturally high in nitrates and nitrates get converted into nitric oxide within the body, which vasodilates, which is great for blood flow because you're good pump in the gym. But I don't, I don't want the calories and I'm not as concerned about exercise performance now because I just want to like lower my body fat and, ho and hopefully hold on to the muscle and the performance that I just got over the past eight weeks. You see, sometimes 
people try to do, and I've done this too, where you try to do everything at once, right? You try to gain muscle, lose body fat at the same time, have good exercise performance, but it's very difficult to do that. It can be done, but it's very challenging. What it probably makes more sense is to kind of do it more like this, is to take an eight to 12 week cycle, try to gain muscle, try to perform well in the gym, then go on a little bit more of like a calorie restricted, like kind of a cut for eight weeks. And, and I think you can kind of get the best of both worlds that way. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna eliminate definitely the beet juice and the, like that, that pre-workout shake. I'm also gonna cut my, my carbs back down again. I think the sweet spot for me is about 100 grams of carbs, which is 400 calories, maybe a little bit more on the days when I'm cycling my calories. I think that's a good rule for anyone watching this. If you're 150 pounds or less, around 100 grams of carbs or so I think is pretty good. If you're like 150 pounds or over, big difference between being 250 and just like 175, you know, 150, 200 grams. It's just carbs, in my opinion, it's just a great way to eliminate empty calories, right? Because there's... You know, the body can always make, you know, um, glucose for gluconeogenesis. Love can make glucose from protein, from fat if you really eat, go, you know, if, you, if you're eating very low carbs. But most of your empty calories are going to be carbs, you know, for sure. Plus, especially carbs mixed with fat, like processed foods, like cookies, cakes, and like junk food like that. The worst thing you can do is to take in like carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates with processed oils. You know, like like a cookie or thing, things along the lines of that. So I'm gonna cut back on my carbs to keep my calories down back into that by maybe about 100 grams a day. I always keep my protein up. I'm gonna stay at about 150 grams of protein. And you know, my general rule for protein is 0 0.9 grams per pound of lean body weight. So if you're 150 pounds, say you're 20% body fat, you're 100, you know, you, you're about 120 pounds of lean mass, you would take it in 100, 100, 108 grams of protein. I think you can even go more. There's lots of times when I, I would go just one gram of protein per pound of body weight if you're really active and working out, which I think is fine. Okay, thanks. Also, I don't know much about fasting, but it's a good idea to do 20 to 40 minutes of vigorous exercise in, a, in the morning to drink glycogen like source quicker to start uh, start fat burning. You know that's that's once again <laughs> juicy. You you see like you know a little bit about this, but you you you're picking like very aggressive strategies. Like what Juicy is talking about, which definitely makes sense, right? When you eat carbohydrates, there's excess carbs that's stored in your muscle and you live in the form of glycogen. If you can first do like an intense say high intensity like aerobic type workout, or even lift weights and deplete glycogen stores, and then go into a fast. You know, you're going to upregulate autophagy. You know, you're, you're going to just speed the whole process up. You're going to just, just for example, just taking a walk after you eat clear, clears glucose. So you'll get all the benefits of that fasted state. You know, the AMPK, the sirtuins, all those, all the good stuff starts happening, you know, when you're on an empty stomach and those glycogen levels get low. So, yes, you know, you can do that, but I, once again, pretty aggressive. Uh, doing that, but try it and just be careful. I can see you doing more of that, like that 30 to 40 minute like vigorous exercise in the morning and then doing more like a 16-8. Who knows, if you're eating low carb and you're doing something like that, you may even dip into mild ketosis just after a 16 to 18 hour fast. You know, so uh, kind of interesting. Okay, James said, I tried a 48 hour fast once, I smelled food, it was all, it wasn't easy. No, I think yeah, it's pretty aggressive a 48 hour fast. The benefits of like, of going into like a longer fast or a couple. First of all, like we talked about that autophagy. Autophagy is like like when the body repairs weak and damaged organ organelles, like mitochondria and recycles them. It's really good. Some people feel it's one of the it's one of the main reasons why people do these extended fasts. It's good for longevity. It kind of fixes the body. And like the other things, the AMPK, the sirtuins, all the you know, you're like you're down regulating mTOR when you do these extended fasts, which is good for longevity and the body kind of repairs itself. Plus you dip, you can dip into ketosis because you did use up all the stored glycogen in your muscles and your liver, you know, so the liver is making um, beta hydroxybutyrate or these, or these ketone type bodies, which is really good for your brain. There's a lot of health benefits to being in a state of ketosis. So that would be like, and, and you're gonna, you know, lose water weight, you're gonna lose some weight being in a 48 hour fast and burn some body fat. So it is a good thing to do from time to time but I think it's aggressive. I do think it's aggressive and not for everyone, for sure. But it's kind of fun to try. You're like, I did that three-day fast. I don't think I'll do it again for a long time. I think that that last day, that last day I love those 24, 36-hour fasts. I think they're great. But back to what Juicy said, 
you can get those same benefits. Like for example, if you're going into a 16 to 18 hour fast, eating a low carb, you're gonna get a lot of the benefits of, in my opinion, of somewhat being in an extended fast too. Okay. So I'm also gonna write, once again, keep my protein up. If you wanna do that 0.9 grams tons of your lean body weight, or you can even go, I think, one gram of protein per pound of body weight. I think that's reasonable. Some people will say that's high, I don't think so. You know, bodybuilders have eaten two grams per pound of, 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 of weight, which I think is too high. But I think one gram to 0.9 grams per pound of lean weight, I think it's a reasonable amount. Things get kind of kooky if you're really heavy, if you're 300 pounds, like the 300 grams of protein seems excessive. I would go more with your goal weight, maybe. Or if you're really petite, say you're a 110 pound gal and you want to get down to 105 pounds, you know, maybe only eating, um, you know, like 100 grams of protein. Now, I think that's probably pr pretty reasonable if you're a 100 pound gal for sure. Like 90 grams of protein is probably pretty good. Okay, and once again, I'm also gonna stop the creatine like I talked about. So I want my body to make it on its own, plus I eat a decent amount of red meat. I mean, a decent amount of salmon. I eat a little red meat and fish and chicken, so I'm gonna get my creatine there. Okay, and let's go over the exact fasting plan. And, and, and Juicy, maybe, you know, this is a, a good thing for you. This is what I think is my favorite intermittent fasting strategy, and I always come back to this. I do pretty much, I love 16-8, I love 18-6, and I love doing all mad on Sunday. And if you're new to this stuff, 16 days just means that you're fasting for 16 hours and then taking in all your calories in an eight hour eating window. 18.6 just means you fast for 18 hours, taking all your calories in a six hour window. And then all mad just means you're eating one meal a day. And I like to do that on Sundays. So to me, how I will be cycling my calories is that Sunday will definitely be a calorie deficit because I'm only eating one meal that particular day. How many, how many calories are I take in one meal? Maybe 1,500 or so if it's a big meal. So I'll be in a calorie set deficit that day. On the days that I'm doing 18-6, I always eat a little bit less. I know some people are not like that. I, I heard Andrew Huberman talk about it on his podcast. I love his podcast, the Huberman Lab. Great, he's the professor from Stanford. He was talking about time-restricted eating, and he felt like from the research that people who give themselves only like a four hour eating window actually eat too much. I don't think that's my, that's not my experience. I know it's not for me and that's not my experience working with people. I find that the shorter the eating window is, the less they eat. So on an 18-6 day, I'll probably be eating less. And on a 16-8, I'll probably be at a kind of like maintenance calories. And this should happen automatically without me necessarily counting calories. But we'll talk about that more, okay? I normally fast 16-8 during the week and do 24 hour fast once a week. The 24 hour is quite a challenge for me. I think I love that plan, I love it. Because on the 24 hour fast, obviously you're in a calorie deficit, right? You're taking in no calories. So it creates a calorie deficit for the whole week or the whole month, right? You're getting that deeper fast state where you're depleting glycogen from your liver, from your muscles, you're probably dipping into autophagy a little bit. I love that plan. And then 16, eight is your core your core eating schedule where you're able to take in enough calories, enough vitamins and minerals and nutrients. I like that strategy a lot. It's one of my favorite. Yeah, and 24 hour fast is challenging, but don't also, don't don't torture yourself too. You know, 22 hours, 24 hours, what, you know, it's a couple hours here or there. If you feel good on a 22 hour fast and then you're like dying and, and torturing yourself for those last couple of hours, do a 22 hour fast, right? Do an OMAD day, something like that. I wouldn't torture yourself. The whole, the whole idea is have that long-term strategies to keep it maintain an optimal weight and to stay healthy, right? Okay. So I'm gonna do this 16-8, 18-6 OMAD on Sunday and I'll be cycling my calories, but over the course of the week or the course of the month, I'm gonna definitely be in a calorie deficit. What do you say? Let this see, I think that popped up twice. Okay, no big deal. Okay, but let me talk about, this is kind of a, and this is how, this is the first time I'm doing this. And this is how I'm gonna do this 16-8 or 18-6. I'm gonna use the Zone app, which will um, control my eating window. This is what I mean by that. I don't know if you ever looked at it, but if you look, if you go to the Apple Store, there's, there's, like, there's an intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating app called Zero. It's really cool. You can load it on your phone, it's free. There are paid programs, but you can just use the free one. And I think it's great. And there's a couple of like, you know, like rock stars of fasting on that app too that kind of explain things to you. One's that guy, Peter Atia. I talk about him all the time. He's the Harvard doctor that specializes in longevity. He's really into fasting. He teaches some lessons on that app. There were some free lessons. There were some you can pay for, but look it up on your phone. Also, Thomas Delore. I really like his YouTube channel. He's really into fasting, a big muscular guy. 
he was like 300 pounds now he's like shredded he's really into fasting he's into keto eating he's into like low carb eating kind of on the same page as me he's on that app too he gives you some lessons on it but what i like about the app is just one simple feature they have a clock on that app so for example when you stop eating you just hit this button and then it just starts your countdown so for example if for me it's so helpful because you know sometimes I eat a little bit later than I thought like for example sometimes I may not be done eating until like 8 37 right that means I that means if I want to do a 16 hour fast I'm not gonna eat the next day until one when, when is that until until that's I think it's like 12 37 the next day will be a 16 hour fast right so say it didn't say one night I didn't stop eating until 9 30 say you know my wife who knows what was going on with us we didn't stop beating until 9 30. i hit the button that means if i'm doing a 16 hour fast the next day i'm not eating till 1 30. and it really helps you keep track but i know you can just use the um the stopwatch on your phone but this makes it a little more official and it kind of it's kind of like reinforces the whole process and i'm going to use that strategy you know going for these next eight weeks my minimum is going to be a 16 8. and this is interesting because when it comes to my workout, like say for example, I ate a little bit late the night before. Say I ate nine o'clock. That means I can't break my fast the next day until one in the afternoon. But say I'm gonna be working out that day based on my client schedule at um at eleven thirty. What that says to me is that I'm doing a fasted workout because I'm gonna stick to this. I really like that. And so for example, but say the next night, say we know we ate early, I was done eating. By seven o'clock, that means I'm breaking my fast at 11. If I'm working at 11.30, I'm gonna work out that particular workout with a little food in my system. I might do, I wouldn't do the beet juice, but maybe I'll do just like a whey protein and water, like a light calorie protein shake. And I'm gonna use that strategy. I've been doing it for this past week and I really, really like it. Let's see what Joe's got. Okay, which app you use to track fasting hours? Yeah, yeah, Joe, I would go with them. Um, I really like this new zero. I do. Look it up. Z-E-R-O. It's really cool. It's free. You can, you can buy the paid version, but that's what I've been doing the last week. And I really like it. And that's also, in a way, going to make sure that sometimes I'll be working out fasted and other days I'll be working out with some food in my system, which is kind of easy. And it just takes the thought process out of it. I would try it. I, you know, I, re I really like it. Okay. I told you about Okay. And then I'm going to go back to my normal low-carb, whole food, natural diet. I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures at the end. I'll show you a bunch of pictures. Oh, great. Stuff. Yeah, and let me know what you think about it, Joe. I, 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 think, you're, I think you're gonna like it. Oh, hey, hey, Gene's here. Hey, oh, Gene, thanks again for, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Gene always gives me some money every every time, every Sunday. And this is the first time, if you guys have been following me, well, I'm gonna start doing it every every Sunday at 11 now when I do this. I may make it a little bit shorter. I think the last time I went two hours, maybe too long. I'm gonna start, try to stay on that 60, you know, 60 minutes, maybe 90 minutes. We'll see. So let's, let's see what Gene's got. Hey, Mike, still on my diet break considering fasting every Monday for the next three weeks to maintain I think that no I love it I think that's great so you I know you I, I you know I know you hit three I think you hit 240 48 last week right or 250 I'm not sure but I know you did re, you did really you were doing really well really well you felt like you needed a break which is great I think there's a great way to do it to um just do like one maybe 24 one on my day one day a week just to keep things in check and just make sure you're getting, you're getting good vitamins and minerals and nutrients you know, during your normal week. I think it's great. I think it's great. But check in with me. Leave some comments during the week too if you need any help or let me know Let me know how you're doing. I think it's a great way to do it. Excellent. And then I'm gonna go back to my normal low carb, you know, whole food natural diet, like no processed foods, no junk, things like that to keep my calories in line. But I'll show you pictures at the end. And, and there's a couple things that I did over the last eight weeks that I'm gonna be, keep an eye on more. Like I, after, and sometimes I don't show those in the pictures. Like if you follow me on Instagram, my call of fitness, You'll see all my meals when I break my fast and my dinners. I kind of post them there. I've even been doing. I, it seems like a lot. A lot of people are enjoying those shorter videos that I'm doing, showing you exactly what I eat, like what I eat in a day. It seems like the people who follow me already, like like you guys, really like them. A lot of new people don't seem to be reacting to them because maybe YouTube is not putting them out there in the algorithm. But who knows? But I, you know, you, you can get a really good idea of of how I'm eating just by looking at those videos. But a couple of things I don't put in them, which sometimes I should, is that sometimes after I have my lunch, I have my dinner, I'll take a couple of squares of dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate, like 85% or higher, high in magnesium, high in fiber. But these past eight weeks, I was doing a little bit more than just two squares. Maybe I was doing a whole row 
which could be 190, 200 calories. So I'm just gonna cut 100 calories out here and there. So I may just do two squares instead of doing four. I'm gonna do things like that. Like afterwards, sometimes I would eat, I like eating walnuts and mixed nuts. This time I'm just gonna take six walnuts, which is like 190 calories, instead of just taking the bag of walnuts and cracking. I, I like to crack them up with a, with a nut crack. It kind of slows down the whole eating process. It makes it fun too. So I'm gonna make like little changes just to kind of reduce my calories like that. A little bit of less that dark chocolate, you know, keep an eye on how many walnuts I'm using. I'm also gonna keep an eye on uh, like a measure, my EVOO, extra virgin olive oil. Typically if I'm sauteing vegetables, or if, I, if I'm sauteing like chicken, making like a chicken, um, you know, like just chicken cutlets, I'll, it, it, sometimes I just pour the olive oil and then make it. But what I'm gonna do now going forward is I'm gonna take a half a, a tablespoon, half a tablespoon, measure it out. You know, a tablespoon of olive oil is 130, 640 calories. So little changes like that is gonna reduce my calories without making too big of a difference. I think I may, I, I think I, I won't, I probably won't even notice it. Another thing I'm gonna do, and I have some pictures of this, is that if I get hungry, I'm gonna just do those green powder drinks. Some people like athletic greens. I like um, either green vibrance. I have pictures of them we'll talk about at the end. Amazing greens, and this is a new brand that I just got too. I'll show you pictures of it at the end. It kind of curbs appetites, it's like taking a multivitamin. They're only like 20, 30 calories, these powders. I think they really suppress appetite, at least they really do for me. I think, and I just think it's a good healthy thing to do all the time as well. Let's see, Gene, what you got? I see, you what 240, I thought you were 240, that's great. 248 pounds last week, but I was 257 this morning. Okay, well, you know, you, you, you this you, this has happened to you in the past, so don't be concerned about it. But you, you're hitting like lower lows, right? So when you take a diet break like this, yes, you may gain eight, nine, 10 pounds, but then when you kick into the good, to the calorie restriction again, instead of being that 248, you're gonna see 238 in a few weeks. So I think this is good. I think it's working for you. So I would stick with it, Gene, for sure. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about how I'm gonna change the workout program a little bit. So, when it comes to the um, the resistance training, since my elbows got like a little tender, and uh, I, I, felt, I, felt, I started feeling a little banged up, you know, from pushing too hard over the past eight weeks, I'm gonna do mostly metabolic stress weight training. And what I mean by metabolic stress, I mean, I, I, I forget who wrote this paper a number of years ago. They classified pretty much how you put muscle on your body like hypertrophy. And the three basic principles were first muscle tension, just think like you're lifting heavy muscles, creating tension, you get a response, you put on muscle that way. The, one, the other one is muscle damage. You know, you make those little microscopic tears in the muscle, mostly from the eccentric load. And then the third way is metabolic stress. By pumping up the muscle, by pumping up your body, metabolites build up hydrogen lactate, and that creates an exercise response. And I love training that way. First of all, it's really enjoyable to pump yourself up. It's like a really lot of fun. You can use relatively lighter weights, not super light weights, but lighter weights. It just feels good. It's good for your joints, good for your ligaments, good for your tendons. And I also mentioned too, guys, if you're enjoying this, make sure you give me a thumbs up because YouTube loves the algorithm. They'll put it out there to more people and share this with anyone you can who you might think you know might find this really helpful. It really would help my channel, so I really appreciate that. I keep on forgetting to say that. So over the next eight weeks, I'm gonna focus on mostly metabolic stress. I'm gonna keep the reps on the high side. I'm gonna be in that like 15 to 20 rep range for the whole eight weeks. I'm not gonna do any triples. I'm not gonna do six to eight reps. I'm gonna keep the reps really high. It's gonna help. It's gonna make my elbows feel better. They're already feeling better from doing this like for one week already. I'm gonna keep continuous tension on the muscle. I'm gonna do more like a bodybuilding itch type protocol. And what I mean by continuous tension is like, say say for example, you're doing a push-up. I'm not gonna lock my elbows out after every repetition and rest on top. I'm gonna keep my, my elbows slightly bent just to keep that continuous tension. And I'm gonna do that with every single exercise I'm doing. Like for example, even if, you, even if you're doing say, let's say you're doing a bicep curl, just think of a dumbbells here. If you go all the way, all the way up and, the, and just think of gravity, the, the weight is balanced, there's no tension. So by just not quite going all the way up and then just not quite going all the way down or like when I'm bench, you know, when I'm doing like a dumbbell press or a fly or a cable fly, I'm gonna keep the tension on the muscle. I'm gonna close it down. I want the metabolites to build up. I love, I love training like this. I like lifting lighter weights too because it's more fun. It's just a fun, fun way 
to work out. I still may take a little L-citrulline before the workout, which is no calories. I talked about this before. L-citrulline is a non-essential amino acid. It does a similar thing to what beet juice does, but it uses a different mechanism. It helps the body make arginine, and then arginine increases nitric oxide. See, the more if you can increase nitric oxide for your workouts, whether it's taking like a beet powder or taking L-citrulline, you're going to get a good pump in the gym. It's going to help you with this metabolic stress type training. And obviously, I'm not going to do anything over the next eight weeks that causes pain in my joints in any way, shape, or form because I kind of messed up. Yeah, I've been doing this my whole life, you know, no pain, no gain type of a thing. You know, you feel a little pain in your elbows, you ignore it, and you just keep on going. But I'm not doing that for these next eight weeks. Oh, Dev, hey, Dev, I, Debra, thank, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Two, two, um, uh, to like live chat, I, you know, I'm not even, I'm so, I should know this. I'm not even sure what a super sticker is, but I know you've probably given me $5 somehow. I have to figure out what that is. I guess there's different ways um, you can donate to someone, but I love that. I like the dancing um, emoji. That's really cool. Thanks, Steph. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad that, I'm glad the um, the egg protein powder worked for you, which is really great. Cheerful balloon party home. That's great. Love it. Thanks, Deborah. Really nice. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna you know, take a little L-citrulline probably. Get, get, get. I'm gonna do like pump training, metabolic stress training, and I really, really love it. I think it's a great way to do it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, thanks, Debra. I really appreciate it, Debra. That's great, you're so nice, thanks. Mm. And then, but like I say, I'm gonna keep the reps um, on the high side. And, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but I'm also gonna use a slow rep cadence. I really like a slow rep cadence, okay? Because if you're not familiar with, there's a concentric and an eccentric phase whenever you're lifting weights. The concentric phase means that, like you're making your bicep, right? You're curling. The muscle is shortening under tension. When you lengthen on the on the load, it's the eccentric phase. And so much of your like your strength gains and even like the muscle damage things like that happen eccentrically. So I like to exaggerate the eccentric phase of a lift. So for example, if I'm bench pressing, I may go up for a count of two, one, two, but then I may lower the weight really slowly, like four or five seconds. So I'm gonna use like a probably like a six or maybe seven second rep cadence. So I'm gonna do pretty long sets. A set could last me 60, 90 seconds, say if I'm doing 15 reps or higher. But I think that's another great, great way to minimize the pressure on your joints because the weights are lighter. And I talked about this the last live stream. You have to be careful at the point of transformation when you're lifting weights, like when you're changing direction. Oh, Krill, oh, thanks for showing up, Krill. Channel growing, oh, thanks, Krill, I really appreciate it. Krill makes tons of comedy. He's been following my stuff for years. I really appreciate it, he's, he's a wonderful guy. You always have to be careful when you're changing direction, similar to sports. Like, like say you're a tennis player, you're running in one direction, right? You stop, you pivot, and you change direction. That's where you can kind of get hurt when you're aggressively changing direction. It's the same thing with weights. So if you're doing like a bench press and you're lowering the weight and then you're kind of like bouncing off bottom or just letting the weight fall and, and trying to explode up, that's where you can kind of get hurt. But when you're doing these slower rep cadences and you're doing a nice slow eccentric repetition, no matter what exercise it is, say you're squatting, you're slowly going down, pause for a millisecond and kind of, kind of come up, I think it takes the pressure off your joints. I think it's a great way to train and it's really fun. And then I'm also gonna be doing that blood flow restriction training. I did a whole live stream on this if you wanna look look at look it up a couple of weeks ago. That, those are those bands where you occlude the limb, for example. At the end of probably every body part when I'm training, and it's more for legs and arms, but it really works all over the body. For example, you know I have a bad knee. So for example, I, I, my last set of doing say, my last set or two of say doing even just body weight squats and maybe doing squats holding a dumbbell, I'm gonna put these bands in my upper thigh, which makes the blood pool in my legs. It's called occlusion training. So it helps this metabolic stress, enhances it even more. So it's gonna kinda like trap the blood in my limbs. It minimizes that venous blood return to the, to the heart. So hydrogen, lactate, those type of things build up even more. You get an incredible burn in a very lightweight. So I'm gonna start incorporating for sure, even though I've always been doing, but I'm gonna do it a little bit more, blood flow restriction training. Definitely when I'm training my legs and my arms, maybe the last set or two, and even just training my body, training my body in general. I've been using it also on my aerobic days. Like when I'm training my legs, I also put those bands on my thighs and I'll end my leg workout with maybe a seven or eight minute Stairmaster, 
at a very low level, so it's easy on my knee, but my legs get an incredible pump and they're burning because that metabolic stress of from metabolites are building up. It's really great. It's, I love this blood flow restriction training. I think it's great. And another change I'm going to make is that I'm going to reduce the frequency of training each body part. That's another reason why why I think my my old my old elbow tendonitis started creeping back. Is that what I was doing eight weeks ago? Is that Monday I was doing a full body, like training my whole body. Wednesday I was doing like upper body, and then Friday I was doing lower body. So I was training each body part twice per week. I'm going to switch now to 1.5, meaning that I'm just going to do a split. So Monday, say I'll train upper body. Wednesday, I'll train lower body. Friday, I'll train upper body. But then the next week, I'm going to switch it. So like, for example, one week, say upper body will get trained twice. The next week, lower body will get, get, get trained twice, which will give my joints a little bit more recovery. I know this is debatable, but I, I do think the older you get, probably the more recovery you need. And it's also it also depends upon how hard you're working out, right? If you're working out really, really hard. So I think the mistakes I made eight weeks ago or the, is that I probably, I just worked out a little too hard, I increased the weights too much, I ignored when my elbow started creeping up. And I think two times per week per body, but for me at 59, with the amount of, I was spending like an hour, hour for 75 minutes per resistance training workout, which is too much, which is too, even though it worked, you know, and I put on a little bit of muscle, but I'm going to switch and do a lot safer, more enjoyable type routine now too. Okay. Now I'm also, so that's going to be the resistance training Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now when it comes to doing the cardio sessions, I'm going to do two hard cardio workouts per week. They're not going to be too long. So say Tuesday, Thursday with abs. So I'm gonna do maybe five to seven hard intervals, 30 to 60 seconds per record. This is what I mean by that. I like, because of my knee, I'm, I'm, I'm a little limited. I'd love to run, but I can't, and sprint, I can't do that. So I'm, I, my two go-to aerobic pieces of equipment at my gym is the elliptical and the Stairmaster. My knee can tolerate that pretty well. So I'm, for example, like say I get on the elliptical, I do five minutes easy, you know, get my heart rate up, then, I, then I'll do you know, maybe 30 seconds really hard, or maybe I'll do 60 seconds really hard, then I'll go easy for a minute, 90 seconds. And I'll do that five to seven times. And that's to me is a good high intensity type workout. And when I mean hard, I may not go to max heart rate. You know, you may know this, the typical formula to figure out your max heart rate. And it is an estimate, it's to take 220 minus your age. So say I'm 60, my max heart rate would be 160. If you're a gal, sometimes they say you may want to go 227, go a little bit higher. So, you know, maybe my heart will, will hit 160, maybe it'll be 155. You know, if you go 90, 95%, I think that's a good interval type, like a high intensity interval level. And I'll do that five to seven times. So maybe that work, it'll take me 20 minutes, something like that. If, if I feel like I need more of a cool down, I may just go easy for an extra 10 minutes just to kind of relax and get my, you know, my head back, back together. <laughs> Out of all my uh, workouts, these are my least favorite. I don't really like doing high intensity cardio. I've been doing it my whole life and been forcing myself to do it. It's just uncomfortable, you, you know, I don't enjoy it, but I do it because it is really beneficial. So that would be like my VO2 max training. You know, VO2 max is one of the biggest indicator of how ropely fit you are. It measures like how much oxygen you can consume when you're working out at a maximum level. And high intensity overall, which is really good for increasing your VO2 max. And there is some science out there and research saying that longevity is associated with people who have a higher VO2 max. So you're gonna live longer if your VO2 max is uh, is higher. Plus it clears glucose too, right? It gets rid of carbohydrates from your muscle and your liver, which is kind of a cool thing too. But I'm also gonna do my abs. I don't know if abs is the right word. I'm gonna do also do my core work on the days that I'm doing my high intensity cardio. And I like mostly non-movement type exercises. And you know, if you go to my channel, I got tons of videos on how I do my planks and my rollouts. Planks, you know, is like I'm bracing. And what I mean by non-movement is that I'm not flexing my spine up and down on the low, because I do have a whole bunch of herniated disc in my back and my neck, and sometimes that can aggravate me a little bit. So I do forward plank, side plank. And what I mean by rollouts, you know that wheel exercise? I don't use the wheel. That's too aggressive for my back. I use like one of those Swiss balls. And I, I have some videos on this where I roll the ball out, I roll the ball in. But if you're noticing, I'm just maintaining like a neutral spine. So I'm just digging in really deep with all my core muscles. And I may even do a churning the pot where you, you get in that plank on the ball and you rotate your arms. And it gives me a great, great challenge to my midsections. And then also on that day, 
I like to do my mobility movement. I'm into that easy movement. You know, you see me in my videos doing this stuff too all the time. I like to lubricate my joints, my spine, my knees, my hips, my ankles, my neck. I go through a whole bunch of mobility movement drills. So maybe, let's say that would be like an hour or so of working out. Same thing with my resistance training. My workouts are gonna be somewhere around an hour, maybe a little bit longer on some days. But since I'm not doing my whole body in one day with the, with the resistance training, I can keep it probably more like at that 60 minute level. If I'm doing a full body, like when I was doing eight weeks ago, I may jump up to 75 or so. And then I'm also gonna do this, and I think this is key. I love it, I would love everyone watching this, if you can find the time to do this. It's probably the singular best thing, or one of the singular best things you can do for your health when it comes to fitness, is just start walking every single day. And I'm gonna walk a lot, but you don't even have to walk this much. I mean, research is showing, I talk about this all the time too, just taking a 10 minute walk after you eat clears glucose, like lowers blood sugar, just as well as taking metformin, a diabetic medication that type two diabetics take to clear glucose to just control their blood sugar. It really works just as well, or almost as well. Berberine does too, we're gonna to talk about berberine too. If you can just take a 10 minute walk after every time you eat something, or just move around the house, vacuum, vacuum your house after you eat, you're gonna clear glucose, you're gonna be healthier, because similar to what I was talking about, VO2 max, a lot of these like, you know, I don't know, Peter T, I've heard him say, talk to us about this a little bit, a longevity doctor, but a lot of like researchers and longevity people are all saying now that maybe controlling glucose may be the biggest indicator of longevity, of how long you're gonna live, like your lifetime of controlling glucose. So if you can do simple things that every time you eat, you just move around for 10, 15 minutes, take a walk, especially now with the good weather, with, with the, you know, at this time of the year, it is so beneficial. But this is what I'm gonna do, and I really love this. First of all, I love being outside, it's like I'm meditating when I'm moving, it puts me in a good mood, it keeps my brain and my mood up for sure, working. Like I'm gonna wake up first thing every morning, and I don't even consider this working working out, it's like working out, it's like, just like you know active, movement, just so good for you. I'm gonna take a 30 minute walk, obviously fasted after a cup of coffee, first thing in the morning, every morning. And I'm doing this for multiple reasons. First of all, I mentioned this before, it's, it's, this is like task completion. Besides you just waking up and moving, which is so good for you, it's actually getting something done first thing in the morning. It mentally is such a good thing for you. I don't know if you ever watched that Admiral give the speech, he talks about it in the military, how people, were, one of the main reasons why he, he wants like soldiers or whatever to make their barracks, to make their bed in the morning, besides they want a clean barrack is that, is the idea of waking up and as soon as you get up, doing something and completing a task psychologically is so incredibly good for you. So if you wake up in the morning, right, drink a big glass of water, maybe have a cup of tea or something and then just go out and walk for 30 minutes and it could just be 10 minutes. You've completed a task, it's such a wonderful thing to do. And I've been doing this for multiple reasons, right, Scott? I wanna complete my task, I wanna burn some a little body fat, and I'm doing my backwards walking like I've been talking about, which is definitely helping my knee. So I'll walk maybe 20 minutes forward, maybe 10 minutes backwards. First thing every morning I'm doing that. Then I'm also gonna do my long two hour walks on those two other days where I'm not working out, which is most likely Saturday and Sunday, like today. After this live stream, I'm gonna take a nice, to our work, which I just absolutely love doing, especially with the weather, plus the sunlight, the vitamin D, I'm getting all those amazing things. So I'm gonna do a two hour walk there. And then this is like the mistake I made. Um, let's see what Deborah got, okay. Deborah says, you are so right about walking. I walk fasted every morning, four to five miles. Oh, Deborah, I'm so happy you're doing that. I just love it. I don't think there's a better thing you can do for your health than doing that. It's wonderful, stay with it. I wish everyone watching this would do that same thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, four or five miles like that, because that's, you know, that, 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 that's a lengthy walk. It could just be a half a mile, a mile. You know, it's, it's just such a wonderful thing to do. And this is what I mean, and now I'm gonna do this, walk whenever I need an active rest. And what I mean by that is like, for example, when I, when I was doing those eight weeks and my elbow started bothering me, I just should have just done this. Don't feel bad, you know, to take a day off from your resistance training if you feel you need it. Like if I feel at any, at any point or any time I need like a little extra recovery. It's not like I'm gonna sit on the couch and eat, and eat potato chips. I'm gonna take a two hour walk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna t turn it into like a walking day. I think it's such a great thing to do. Okay, this is what you said. Mike, have you noticed that every time there's a meta-analysis coming out about benefits of supplements, 
the results are always uh, underwhelming. Yeah, you know, a lot of people feel that. I've even heard, you know, a lot of really well-respected well doctors saying, oh, they do more harm than good. I think it really depends on the supplement. Like nothing, you know, interesting, you know what interesting, Gene? Even when you look at um, just medicine, like you look at metformin, like metformin is just saving people's lives, right? If you're a type 2 diabetic, you're taking your metformin, it's, it's, it's controlling glucose, it's doing all things like that. But if you looked at exercise like just walking and you compared walking, like just walking like 10, 15 minutes after you eat a meal, to like the met, the metformin studies and the results, metformin might be someone uh, you know underwhelming like you're talking about with the supplements. Walking is like exercising in general works it's like better than most drugs. It's just that it's so it's so difficult that people comply to do it. Hey, Lori, thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Morning is is the only time I can I can work out. It sets me up for the day. Oh, that's great, Lori. I appreciate you showing up. I know and I know you're in great shape. That's great. Yeah, exercising in the morning is just the best. And then plus you're completing the task. And plus if you can do it on, on an empty stomach, I think there's definitely, in my opinion, there's benefits to that. I know it gets a little kooky like fasted exercise. Like when you're working out fasted, you will burn a greater percentage of fat calories. But, they, but then the respiratory exchange ratio may flip a little bit later in the day and you may burn a greater percentage of carbs. But it's still, I still think it's a wonderful thing to do first thing in the, in the morning. And also, Gene, when it comes to supplements for me, I think you kind of know the type of supplements I like. I like to take real food supplements, meaning that those green powders, all they are are dehydrated fruits and vegetables. And I, I don't even pick the ones that necessarily have synthetic vitamins added to it. I know like Athletic Greens, they add a synthetic vitamin to it. So you're getting like a multivitamin, some some synthetic things, and you're getting all the whole food. The type of supplements I like, I like pro I do like protein powders, whether it's a collagen, it's just dehydrated, you know, they scrape the back of cow hides and you're getting all the amino acid profiles of collagen. I like a whey protein, a hemp seed protein, a pea protein. So, I mean, I like those supplements. And I do like, for example, that beet powder, all it is is dehydrated beets. L-citrulline is made in the lab, but it's plant-based, but it's it's really, you know, like a non-essential amino acid that really gives you a nice pump. The type of supplements that I personally take that I like, in my opinion, are just food like 90% of them. But I do take a multivitamin that has some synthetic ingredients in it. Sometimes I take New Chapter, which is just a whole food vitamin, which is just like taking a green powder, which is all dehydrated fruits and vegetables. But sometimes I will take like Alive, Men's Alive. I wrote my wife takes some Women's Alive, which is a partly synthetic, partly whole natural food. So, you know, I, I like supplements, but I can overdo it myself. And I know I know a lot of the research it, it is doesn't support all the different supplements for sure. And then also, you know, whenever I do a walk, I also like to say I always do a little bit of ab work. It's good for my back. You know what I've been doing? I know Gene knows this. He he, he follows Stuart McGill too because I have all those herniated discs in my back. Every time I get back from a walk, I do my my three core moves. Like I'll do like a forward plank, I'll do a side plank, and then I do this thing called bird dogs. Look them up on YouTube. I have some I have some some uh, videos on them on that on my channel too. It's really good for my back, good for my core. It's not hard. I just do it. I do it more for endurance than I do for um. They're trying to get like a six pack. And you get a six pack from low body fat anyway, right? Okay. Is milk thesis increased estrogen? You know, um, I'm not sure. I think you asked the question about the, about that other medicine last time. I'm not sure. I know milk thesis, they say, I'm not an expert on that. I know it's good for your liver. Some people say, does it increase estrogen? I can't say. I don't particularly take milk thesis. So I can't, I'm t sorry, I felt bad. Last week, your question, I couldn't ask you either. I think you were talking about that acne medicine. I didn't know about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, and, and uh, let me talk about this. So, you know, since I am turning 60 in August and I'm doing this whole thing to get my body fat levels low to take some pictures, you know, for my 60th birthday. You know, Frank Zane, my favorite bodybuilder who's right behind me, look, look at him, He's, he would do it on his birthdays. Clarence Bass, also, I, I always was a big fan of his, another like older guy type bodybuilder. He would always do these things for his birthday too. So I'm still giving myself one month. Like for example, after it's an eight week cycle, I still have about a month before my birthday. So I may do something a little bit more aggressive. So in a month from now, after this eight cycle, I'm going to reassess and make adjustments. And I think this is a good thing for people to do just in general. You always should be reassessing and making adjust adjustments. So after these eight weeks, hopefully my body fat will be a little lower. I got four weeks and then I got to see, do I really want to try to get down to like, you know, those single digits, like 9% body fat and really see my six pass or am I happy? If I really want to get down there, I may do a few things. Then I might really start 
counting calories, and I mean count everything. Use my fitness pal, enter every single food I'm eating, you know, really be a little more aggressive, track all my macros, you know, be really, really be scientific and strict. It always works, it's just a lot of work. Then I also might do this, this is a kind of like a bodybuilding thing. This is what we would do 35, 40 years ago. If I wanted to get really lean, I was doing kind of a bodybuilding protocol. We might do like maybe two, three weeks before you want to look your best, you might want to go into a state of ketosis, which I might do, you know, and then you start burning body fat like crazy. So I might do that for a couple of weeks, go into ketosis and burn burn a bunch of body fat. And then right before I take some pictures, and I'll share the pictures with everyone if things go well, right? Then you may want to just carb up. This is what like a bodybuilder might do. This is a protocol we used for bodybuilders back then where, for example, you know, you're restricting calories, you're, you're getting really, really lean. Like, like say you're going to be on stage in a contest maybe three, four weeks out. You might want to go into a state of ketosis, right? You're not going to have too much good energy to work out because you're not a keto person. You're still probably a car burner. But you go into ketosis, you lower your body fat. And then two or three days before you're going to be on stage, you carb load. Right, you eat 300 grams of carbohydrates, 400 grams of carbohydrates for a couple of days. What that does, it fills up your muscles with glycogen, it volumizes the muscle cell, and you look great. The the kooky thing is that sometimes you get the timing off. That's the you know one of the, the one of the arts of perfecting how you look on stage as a bodybuilder or whatever is that you gotta kind of kind of time all these things. Sometimes people look better two days after the event because they should have carb loaded sooner or, or whatever. You know, but it, I may do something like that. We'll see. We'll see. Like I tried to do this last year, and I just I couldn't. I, I messed up with COVID. I just got, I got completely thrown off. But I feel like I'm in a good groove now, so I'm gonna try this. If you guys want to do it with me, it would be a lot of fun. Or if you want to go, if you want to do this like eight week kind of like a cut with me, it'd be a lot of fun too. Where you're restricting and and you're doing all the things that I'm talking about. I would love you to do it with me. MCT oil. Oil. I don't think it's. I don't think MCT is trans fat. Medium train triglycerides. I don't think there's trans fats in M MCTs. I don't think. I know that coconut oil is half MCT, right? If you did something like that, um, I don't think. Not sure. <laughs> I'm also not not a big. Um, I have to say, most of my fat, even though like like if you would look at like I didn't talk about that too much in this past. If you look at my diet now, that I'm going to do over these next eight weeks, since I'm not really tracking fat, proteins, carbs, we're going to make sure I'm taking enough protein, 150 grams. I'm going to kind of track maybe carbs a little bit. When it comes to fat. I'm not going to track it. See, most of my fat's going to come from the whole natural foods I'm eating. Like I'm eating avocados. I'm eating like you know salmon. I'm going to get fat from there. All saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, all from that. And then olive oil is just my main go-to. See, I don't even really use coconut oil a a anymore. I used to use coconut a little bit or, or um, avocado oil. I don't buy MCT oil. I don't do that bulletproof core fat. I don't do anything like that. I do love olive oil. I think it's by far the best um, oil to even go raw in salads and saute vegetables with it. I wouldn't worry about the heat point of like alcohol burning. The polyphenols are so high in olive oil. Oh, they're so protective. I love, I love olive oil. Oh, hey, thanks for showing up. That's great. You know, I think it's great. Oh, no, I appreciate it. I love you asking the questions. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to, I'm not going to make something up. I'll, I'll let you know, but I appreciate it. But olive oil is, is by far my go-to. Yeah, olive oil. No, I love olive. I know bootlegger. You do have to be careful about that. I spoke about that. I, I like um, Bragg's. That's my phone. I go to. That's the organic certified one. It's like it's, it's a reasonably priced olive oil. About liters, about twenty bucks. I go to that. I know you got to be careful with a lot of them. There's another California brand that's certified that I get to. But I generally use everyday olive oil. I don't buy the really expensive ones. And I do. I know you got to be careful with certain ones from certain parts of the world for sure. I know what these bootleg. I, and like I said, I, we talked about it at the last last live stream. Yeah, I think Bragg's. I think Bragg's is a Bragg's definitely is um definitely is a good one. Yeah, I I think you can tell from the bitterness. Like when you when you taste that olive oil, you know you should have that bite. You should almost like slightly burn the back of your throat. So many times, you, even you go to an Italian restaurant, they put olive oil out. You taste it with a little bread, and it, there's nothing to it. You know, it's like canola. It's a combination of it. It needs it needs that bite, and you know it's you know it's the real thing. Is saturated bad? You know, I, I'm not a. I would say fatty liver, in my opinion, would be more like too many carbs, too much processed food. I think saturated fat, you don't want too much of it, but I think some of it is totally okay. A lot of it has to be, you know, it depends how far you want to take it. I know some people have that APOE4, like, the, like, like, like those two snippets, and they don't process saturated fat as much. I don't know if you ever had that expensive blood work done where you really look at your genotypes and things like that. Some people don't process saturated fat. I think it's like 25, 26% of the population have issues with it. Um, 
Like for example, if if you go if you go on a ketogenic diet, and then your cholesterol goes to four five hundred, unfortunately, you may have those genotypes, you may have those snippets that you're not process, processing saturated fat well. But I think a little bit of saturated fat is okay. I don't really. Most of my fat is probably monounsaturated. I like. I'm a little careful with all that. I eat a, a probably 50, 60 percent of my calories probably comes from fat, but it's coming mostly from olive oil, from monounsaturated fat, from avocados, and avocado. Every day I eat sardines almost every day. I eat salmon every day, you know. But I'm not really putting butter on my steak if I have a steak or, or my salmon. I'm not, you know, like putting the MCTs or coconut oil in my coffee. You know, I I like monounsaturated fat. That's what my favorite type of fat. That's why I love olive oil. And olive oil has everything. But it's mostly monounsaturated. Same with like an avocado as well. All right. I'm late today, but anyhow, I catch up. Oh, that sounds good. I appreciate you showing up. Great. Thanks for showing up. Great to see you. Okay. So let's go over now. Now let's see. So you got my whole gist here, what I'm doing maybe a month out before the birthday, just to, in case I got to like wheel it in, you know? A little bit of a bodybuilding protocol. Let's see. Something. How to increase ATP, and it's in drive. Well, you can't really. I know that you can't. You can't really increase necessarily increase ATP in the body. You know, you can store five to seven seconds of that ATP in your muscle, right? Then you can take like once you use that up, you're left with ATP, and it's in diphosphate. And then you can take. Um, I would say creatine. Because it, the, if you take creatine as a supplement, you'll store more in the muscle. You can make ATP a little bit better, but you can't really increase. I know there's a lot of, there are some trademark supplements that they claim you can like help make ATP better. It's all the process of making ATP. I wouldn't necessarily say increasing it, you know. But I think creatine is probably number one because the more creatine you can store in the muscle, the quicker you can make ATP. So I would look at it like that, right? Okay, so let's go over now, and this. Then we'll do a Q and A. Let me let me go over some of my how I've been eating, like how, like this, and also I'll compare this to some changes. Like what I was doing eight weeks ago is that I was I was definitely having more volume of food. I really love this meal. This is kind of what I think. This is the perfect way I think to break your fast or post workout. It's, it's just a nice it's a nice meal. It's not too heavy. Have you heard of olive oil and citrus oil combination? No, I haven't, but I, I like that. I like citrus. I like citrus a lot. And a lot of people, even when they're fasting, will put a little bit of um, lemon juice in, in like water and Pellegrino water in the morning. I know I, I heard Andrew Huberman talk about that in his last um, podcast he did a couple of weeks ago, saying that it actually lowers blood sugar, which you would think is counterintuitive, right? Because you think a little bit of lemon juice, but they say a little bit of citrus, a little lemon juice, lime juice can actually lower blood sugar, which is kind of cool. So a lot of people fasting like to do that. But this is what I'm talking about. When I mean like a whole natural food diet, you know, prioritizing protein with an adequate amount of protein, good amount of fiber, healthy omega-3 fat. I don't think you can beat like this meal here. Let's say, hey, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't creatine increased the hardness of muscle fibers? I, I don't know if I would use the term hardness of muscle fibers, but it volumizes the muscle cell because the more creatine you can store, the more water you're gonna hold. So I don't know if I would use the term hardness, but it's gonna make you look more muscular, no, no question about it. The only, the only, the only people who, who I think creatine hasn't worked for, if you're eating like an insane amount of like red meat, if you're one of these guys or gals are just like pounding the red meat, eating red meat like two, three times a day, you're eating two pounds of red meat somehow, or, or maybe a pound and a half of red meat and you're eating tons of salmon and you're eating fish and you're eating, I mean, just an insane, like you're carnivore, maybe. If you're on a carnivore diet, and you're eating two 250 grams of protein a day, creatine may not work for you. But um, I think it's gonna work for most people, especially vegetarians. Creatine is in interesting. It's kind of like a molecule. I've heard some people say it's amino acid, but I, th I think it's a little bit more, I would call it like a molecule. And uh, you know, just involved in energy systems, and it's, it's so well studied. Even five grams a day is really good for cognitive. There's been a lot of, it's fun. I, I keep on bringing these guys up, Andrew Huberman, that, that professor at Stanford. He, what I was surprised to hear this, and I didn't realize this because I never looked at the science, the research that way. That way, he said there were there's more research about creatine for cognitive for your brain than there is for like exercise performance, and there's like tons of studies on exercise performance. So it's kind of interesting. Let's see, then not hardness, but about increase in yeah density. Yes, it's going to make it bigger for sure. 
I, I think, but it's, that's mostly from the water retention. It's going to make the muscle cell look big. And then you're going to get, but then you're going to, you're going to get the response, meaning that when you do have the creatine in your system, like it was in my system, you know, a few weeks ago, you're going to be stronger. So you're going to be able to use more resistance, increase your weight to increase, you know, whatever you're doing, your calisthenics, whatever. And you're going to get the, the response there. So you're actually going to get the myosin act. You know, you actually, the muscle cell itself is going to get bigger from, from the fact that you're able to work out harder. So look at it like that. You're going to have more water in the muscle, which is going to volubilize the muscle cell. It's not that the necessarily creatine molecule itself is going to make it big. It's really more the water. But you're going to be able to work out harder, lift heavier weights, you know, get more stuff done in the gym or wh wherever you're working at at home, and you're going to have a better response. So you know, you're going to be more muscular. There's no question about it. Creatine works. And I, I just love this meal. Like a couple of cool things. So like we got the avocado here, right? Loaded with potassium. Maybe eight nine hundred milligrams of potassium. Then we got the. And then let's see. Oh, hey, it's amazing that you can still do side side raises and overhead arm press. It seems that every shoulder exercise like, gives me irritation these days. Push ups, dumbbell rows are fun though. You know, I go in and out of all these things. For some reason, I, mean, I do like. I know we talked about this before. I do have a torn labrum in my right shoulder. Me and my wife went. I mean, this is before my kids were born. This is over twenty years ago. I fell snowboarding, really bad fall, slightly dislocated my right shoulder, tore the labrum. Then I had an MRI then like 10, 15 years later, I got a, I got a bone spur and a torn labrum. So for some reason, laterals don't bother me, but I can't do a barbell shoulder press. I can do dumbbells or I like the upside down kettlebell. Even like straight bar bench pressing bothers me. That's why I use dumbbells because like I said, always say your hands want to come together, less shearing force. You know, hey, we're getting older, right? You got to do the best you can. I probably should have my shoulder fixed one day. I, 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 when I had the MRI done about 10, 12 years ago, the doctor wanted to just cut away the torn label. I didn't want to do that. I would want to try to have it fixed. But now that I'm turning 60, a lot of surgeons won't even attempt to try to you know, re-sew it because they think you're too old. We got to just cut it away. But I don't know. You got to just do the best you can. I always find there's something else you can do. Like you, you know my issue with my knee. I'd love to be squatting big weight like I always did for most of my life. and. My, I can't really run with my knee. It's just an issue. But I, I actually, it's just interesting. I went to a new surgeon a couple of weeks ago. I think it's two weeks ago now. I'm not sure if I mentioned this last podcast. And he wanted to give me another MRI. I must have had five MRIs on my knee. I've never had an MRI though where they injected dye. And he wanted to do one where they inject dye. He thinks he, he was so surprised no one ever did that in the past. He said, if we can inject the dye, we'll get a better idea. So I might do that. But I don't think I would do anything till after the summer anyway. Because I want to enjoy the summer. I want to do all this stuff that I'm talking about. So here's, here's, this is what I think is like a perfect meal. So we got the avocado here, loaded with potassium, 14, 15 grams of fiber. And I've been doing this and I've been loving it. The only downside is they're so expensive. These are salmon roe eggs, super high in omega-3s. But this little container is like 10 bucks. I buy it at Whole Foods. And that's maybe um, maybe half a teaspoon in each, but great to get your omega-3s. Plus I love the salty taste, you know, taste which is incredible. Okay, which is better for protein, eggs or whey? Both very similar. I like them both a lot. Um, both egg and whey are a complete protein, very digestible, both high in leucine. Leucine is probably the most important essential amino acid for muscle building. Has all the branch chain, leucine, isoleucine, valine. Eggs and whey protein, both are high. Leucine's probably, I mean, whey is probably a little higher in leucine. The big difference between the two, I think whey probably is gonna taste better flavors easier, mixes dissipates really well. I always find egg protein, even though I like it a lot. And I buy the unflavored one. It's a little foamier when you mix it up. It doesn't really, um, I think I think it's a little harder to flavor. Most of the egg white protein powders are unflavored, but I think it's great if you mix it with any type of flavored type liquid. Um, I like them both, I think they're both great. Some people don't tolerate dairy too. I'm lactose intolerant, and I can take a whey protein isolate. A whey protein concentrate upsets my stomach because there is some casein, there's some lack, you know, there's some of that lactose is in the whey, a whey protein concentrate. So, but I, I think they're both great. Okay, I love that these are whey protein um, flavor with glucose. I know, I think yeah, I think whey protein is probably the best tasting protein powder. I'm a big collagen protein pa um, powder. User. I take about 20 grams of collagen protein powder every day. Good for your skin, good for your hair, good for your nails, good for your joints too. But like I talked about in the past, it's not a complete protein. It's missing one of the essential amino acids, which is tryptophan. So obviously that wouldn't be your only protein source. But you can cocktail it with like a meal like this because the stamina is complete protein, the sardines are complete protein. You want to add some protein 
and good for your skin, hair, and nails, you can take some collagen. It's funny, I just listened to another podcast. I can't think of the doctor's name. He wrote, he wrote that book, The Lifespan. He was talking about um, collagen and skin, he, and, he, and I've been doing it. He, he, he gave this test. He said, you can tell the age of your skin, like how healthy your skin is, and he, he correlates skin, like how your skin physically looks and responds to longevity. And he said, you do this test, like you take the skin, you pull it up, and it should quickly pop down within a few seconds. He said, if you're older and you pull your skin up and your skin stays up for like a minute, he thinks the, el- the elasticity of your skin is not good. And it's a sign, it's a negative sign for longevity, which is really interesting. He was saying he really likes the collagen protein powders. I do too. I think they're great. I definitely see a difference in my skin, hair, and nails from taking 20 grams of collagen every two, and you know, every day. So I, I like collagen protein powder for sure. So I think this is a perfect meal. So I'm getting my omega-3s from the fish eggs. Fiber, potassium, I, you know I love sardines. I eat sardines almost every day. Great connective tissue, you get the bones, the skin, great source of protein. I love smoked salmon. The only negative thing about the smoked salmon is that it is smoked, you know, which is not, not the best, but it's lightly smoked. And then some raspberries, I generally go with whatever's on sale. So this is, I would even consider this low carb too. Even though there's some raspberries, which are high in fiber, and the net carbs in an avocado are very low because you, you, you subtract, total carbs might be 25, 30 grams, but then you subtract 15, 16 grams of fiber. This is a pretty good low net carb meal, high in like protein, good omega-3 fats, good for your brain. This is what I think is perfect eating. Protein may increase leaky gut. It's interesting. It's really hard to say. Leaky gut is so complex, but collagen protein powder, which is high in glycine, is supposed to be really good for the lining of your gut. And you know, I, I leaky gut, I, I I definitely would talk to a doctor about it, but um, I, I would do that, that like a diversity of those pre and probiotics. You eat a variety of foods. You know, whole natural food diet, in my opinion, is good for leaky gut. If, if, you've, if you've been, you know, eating unhealthy for decades and unfortunately you got a leaky gut, um, it's an issue, but you, I, I think it could be corrected for sure. But obviously check with your doctor on that one too. Okay, let's, let's go to the next meal. You can see I'm kind of, and it's, this is what I, also what I think is perfect eating. I had this meal um, a couple days ago. Arugula salad, I love the arugula salad. My favorite leafy, micro leafy green, high in nitrate, just like beets, we convert to nitric oxide. 100 grams of, of arugula, like 400 milligrams of nitrates, which is so good for blood flow, so good for everything. I love it. Um, I got about maybe, you know, I don't know, 10 ounces or so of chick- grilled chicken. Now that I'm measuring my extra virgin olive oil, so maybe in the past I would have more olive oil on this, but that's all there. Got my avocado again, some, some of my fish roe eggs. You may not be able to see them, but I got some blueberries in here too. And now that I'm, I'm reducing my calories, I might not even add a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. I may just eat the, the arugula kind of dry because you see the avocado and, and the olive oil that's on the chicken is gonna dissipate into the arugula. Whereas before, I may add another tablespoon of olive oil, I may add some balsamic vinegar, I may do something like that. But th- th- these are like simple ways in which you're just eliminating a few hundred calories from your diet every single day. Instead of adding that extra tablespoon of olive oil, I'm just gonna go with the olive oil on the chicken. When I'm sauteing my chicken in, in, you know, in, a, in a frying pan, instead of just letting the olive oil b- burn, I'm gonna measure out a tablespoon, put it in there. And you really, you don't even notice the taste difference. What I do notice, which I almost like better, is that when I'm done eating this, I look at the bottom of this bowl. I don't see too much oil on the bottom. When I used a lot of extra virgin olive oil when I made the chicken or when I added a tablespoon, you know, I feel like, oh my God, there's a lot of oil in there. There's a lot of olive oil in the bottom of this plate. So I'm eliminating calories that way, which is kind of cool. Okay, let's, let's pick another one. Uh, this is similar to the other one. I love it. I mean, I guess you're getting my gist here. So I got my same. I guess I'm hooked on this. I'm going to probably start spending $10 a day eating fish roe eggs, but I love it. My avocado, my fish, grilled chicken here instead of the arugula, now strawberries. My main fruits, I like the berries. You know, high in polyphenols, all the antioxidants, high in fiber, low in sugar, low in calories. I'm a strawberry, blueberry, raspberry, blackberry type guy. Lately, I've been eating a little watermelon. You know, it's interesting. We know watermelon is one of the highest natural sources of L-citrulline, which gives you that pump in the gym, which is great for blood flow and great for increasing um, nitric oxide. So, and it's watermelon season. We've been having a little bit of watermelon lately too, which I absolutely love. That's this one. And there's another thing that I do. I know I know everyone here, If I know Gene, and we, we spoke about this too. I'm a big believer in, I love celery juice. Some people don't like celery juice because it's high in oxalates, which 
can possibly lead to kidney stones if you're predisposed to it. I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. I know some people are. Why I love celery juice so much is that you get like 1,200, 1,000 milligrams of, of potassium, and that's only 35 calories. So this, this, this bottle, this is evolution. It's called Celery Glow. 35 calories, like 1,000 milligrams of potassium. I think it's, a, it's like a super drink for, to replenish the electrolytes post-workout. So I have that, and then I'm having um, my normal arugula salad, my sardines, and I, I would love I love pasture-raised eggs, healthy fats, healthy, great source of protein. I got my little row eggs there. I mean, this is like a perfect meal, I think. And, and and a little change here, maybe in the past, like when I was doing that eight weeks when I wanted to put on muscle, I may have thrown a protein powder into the celery glow just to up my calories, up my protein, but that, I'm gonna cut back a little bit. So that, those are ways in which I'm cutting back a little bit like that. I say, hey, Mike, would you say weight training or cardio is better? You know, you got to do both. You know, I would say any type of exercise you're doing, you're doing it for the response, right? Like what, you, like, like what I mean by response is you're lifting weights, right, to increase your muscle mass, to maintain your muscle mass, good for flexibility. And you're doing your cardio either to increase your VO2 mass when you're doing your high-intensity cardio. When you're doing your walking, you're doing your base building, you know, that whole full maffetone thing like zone two chop training, you're building your aerobic base good for longevity and you're burning some calories. You're burning calories all around, but don't look at exercise as calorie expenditure. Control your control your weight with how you eat and work out to, rec- to create the response you want. So you want, to do, you want to do it all. You want to do some VO2 max training, some hit training. You want to do some aerobic base building training, good for your heart, for, good for, you know, and then you want to do, you want to do what you call it, some, um, you know, resistance training to either increase or maintain your muscle mass and your flexibility. I, in my opinion, when when elderly people get get um, get weak, that's when they that's when they tighten up. It's like walking on ice, you know, like you just so you can't stabilize yourself. I think muscle tightness is associated with muscle weakness, without without a doubt. Even though you can improve balance and you can improve your flexibility, but get stronger, stay strong when you get older is the key. To staying flexible and preventing yourself from falling. You know, you're an elderly person. You fall, you break your hip. It's somewhat of a death sentence to so many people. You're in, you're in your 80s. I mean, you don't want to fall. That's why they that's why they associate grip strength with longevity too. Because when you when you can grab a railing and hold onto a railing and not fall, you're preventing you know a hip fracture or something, which can really put you out when you're older, which is so sad. Healthy people fall in their 80s and then they they never get out of the hospital, which is so sad. Celery gives me a dozen moves. It's, I mean, hey, not for everyone. Just one stalk, let alone maybe it's the oxalates um, that you have an issue with. I, I wonder. Interesting. I, I, I process celery great. I have no issues with it at all. Let's see. Hey, hey, Mike, if I could only walk once a day, would you say morning or, or after, after dinner? Thanks, John. Hey, Johnny. Hey, thanks for showing up. That's cool. John, you know, I, I think both are equally as good. See, I like morning walking for multiple reasons. First of all, you're probably going to be fasted. Right? So you're kind of dip into fast stores a little bit. Plus, it's that task completion. It just mentally sets you up for a good day. You get something done first thing in the day, and things can't come up. I think after dinner is great, too, because you're going to clear glucose. It's a great way to help to digest the meal and speed things up. But I find that if you say, you know, you wake up one day and say, ah, I'm going to walk for dinner, and then you don't walk after dinner, you're in trouble, right? So I would first, I would just say just for that reason, do it first thing in the day. And there's nothing wrong with taking two walks in the same day. I do it all the time. And that's what I'm going to be doing going forward over these next eight weeks. I'm walking in the morning and I'm walking in the evening. I love those late walks. Like right at 7 o'clock, it's still light, you know, um, I love it. So I would say get that walk in first thing in the morning, and then if you can do it again in the afternoon, in the evening, do it again. Okay, but don't 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 trick yourself and say you're gonna do it after dinner and then not do it. Right? That's the main thing, John. But I'm I'm so happy you showed up. That's great. Yeah, it could be the oxalates too. That's even the you. I'm curious because actually arugula is high in oxalates too. So I wonder if you have if you have arugula. I wonder if you have an issue with that. Co- cocoa. Oh, it's cocoa too. I don't know. Is cocoa high in oxalates? I'm gonna look that up. I'm not sure. Okay. I know this comment might be common sense, but let's say if you eat 200 calories and then burn it off, does that count in your calorie consumption and considered fat? Well, I mean, I, I would look at fasting as just when you're not eating, you're in a fasted state, and I would even almost define fasting. It's funny because Andrew Huberman talks about this that when you like when you eat a meal and you're still digesting that meal, it could take you hours. 
and then you're in a fasted state. So a fasted state is when like blood glucose is extremely low and insulin levels low. It depends how you define fasting, but I would look at fasting as just when you're you're not eating and you've digested all your food and then you're in a fasted state like that AMPK is elevated sirtuins or ele- you know, it's like mTOR is down regulated. So you're not in like a growth phase, you're in a recovery phase, you're dipping into stored energy, like, you know, carbohydrate and muscle in your liver, you know, so I would consider that more um, being in a fasted state. But whenever you're burning calories, it's good. But a calorie restriction is like somewhat being in a, like in a fasted state too. If just, just like say you're not fasting, but you're restricting calories, you're going to get that same thing. Like mTOR will be down-regulated, AMP, k you know, those will be elevated. So calorie restriction is very similar to fasting. You know, I, I'm not the, one of these guys who loves intermittent fasting and says that calories don't count. I think calories do count. I think you could. You, I think you can be super healthy and do all these same things just restricting calories. I just think intermittent fasting is such an easy way of doing it. And I do think the idea of keeping insulin levels low and truly getting into a fasted state, just ancestrally, feast of famine is how we were meant to eat and how things sh- you know should be working. Let's see what Gene. These meals sound great, but they seem so low in calories. Are there? Are they reducing weight or maintaining? You know, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail. No, I I, I agree, Gene. Um, if you looked at some of my meals when I was doing it, like the eight weeks ago, I was doing more things. Like for example, when it came to the celery juice, like I was taking the celery juice and I was dumping a scoop of whey protein powder, maybe a scoop of collagen protein powder, and then after this meal, I might have been eating two strips of. 85% dark chocolate, which was going to be another 200 calories. And, you know, or I, I may have had, you know, instead of just having six Walmarts, I may have had like a uh, half a dozen Walmarts, which is like 400 calories. You know, so I, I'm kind of not misleading, but, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to tighten things up um, over these next four weeks to cycle my calories. Level. But I agree, Gene, they, they are on the relatively low side. But be, you'd be surprised too, though. Like, if I took this salad here, okay, this is only 35 calories, but. If, and I added like, you know, a tablespoon and a half of extra virgin olive oil, which is like 200 calories, some balsamic. But you'd be surprised. And avocado is kind of caloric. There's more calories in this stuff than, 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 than you might think. Mm. Let's see. And this is like, a, it's hard, even this is hard to tell. This is a much bigger piece of salmon. This could be, a, this is close to a pound of salmon. These are those humongous Italian plates that my wife lo- loves. So that's a lot, that's a lot of calories there. This is just an arugula salad again with some onions, some stewed tomatoes. And even though I'm just showing this, I take seconds all the time. I may not take more protein, but I'm definitely gonna take more stewed tomatoes. And I'm definitely gonna have more arugula. So but I love this. I think I showed this last last week too. I love this dinner. This is like a typical dinner. Well, let me talk about this stuff. I show all the meals here. Let me talk about these. These are my green drinks. We got some other questions though. Okay. No problems with, with, with arugula, but isn't it actually low in oxalates? You know, I thought arugula, I think arugula is really high in oxalates. I mean, that's that's what I heard, but I, I could be wrong. Mm. Kiwi also could be issues. Let's see. Um, turmeric. You know, I stopped taking turmeric too. Turmeric, you know, was, ups, was upsetting me for some reason too. And I even heard Andrew Huberman talk about it, how he said it was bothering him too. And there's a reason for it. I, you know, next time, next live stream, I'm going to talk about that. The reason why turmeric, some people have an issue with turmeric, but I do cook with curry and things like that, which has turmeric in it. Okay, let me see. My lower eyelids get swollen and dark within 20 minutes. Wow. So I guess you really have another reaction to it. But but these are the green drinks that I've been taking um, to help me suppress appetite. Plus, it's like taking a vitamin, multivitamin. So these are the super greens. I like this amazing greens. I think I think it's one of the best tasting unsweetened green powders. It really does taste great. I actually love it. It's only like 30, 40 calories. Um, I think it's great. The Green Vibrance, this is like the rock star of these green powders. This is probably the most um, potent. 25 billion probiotics in it. This does not taste good. You know, I have no, I can take anything if I know it's good for me. But this is this is heavy duty. It's great though. I mean, I think it's probably, this is probably the best one if you want to do one. I would, I would say Green Vibrance is the best, but it doesn't taste great. Amazing greens really does taste good. and really enjoyable. And then there's this one. I just bought this one because I want my kids to stop fooling around with it. My kids are coming home from college and now they're home, and I want them to try these green powders. This has it like it's high in chlorella and spirulina, and but they sweeten it with monk fruit and stevia. So this tastes really good. And it's not overly sweet. It's somewhat sweet, but it tastes great. So you almost think you're drinking like a Kool Aid, like a green Kool Aid, but you're getting all the um, dehydrated fruits and vegetables and the grasses and the pre and probiotics. If you're talking about leaky gut, I think I think all these things can be really, really beneficial for leaky gut. 
our, our turmeric consists of anti-inflammatory. No, it does. I mean, people, a lot of people love turmeric, and um, you know, people in India, right, don't have, get old timers and things like that because they're eating so much. They think turmeric, and it, I find it just doesn't. I don't feel great. I may try it again. You know, I've done it on and off my whole life t- t- taking turmeric supplements, and I wasn't sure. Wh- you know, sometimes it's hard to read it, but ever since Andrew Huberman said that he had a major issue with turmeric, I started making the association for myself that, you know, and I would take that CureMed, which is like the, the best brand, which is like super absorbable. And um, and I find that, you know, I don't, I, I felt that I didn't feel great the next day. I just, just you know, it's interesting. I think maybe it's the turmeric. It may not be, but um, it might be, but I'm still cooking with curry. And then I love cooking with curry. I, lo- I love putting curry on like cauliflower and that and just doing maybe, um, like a curry salmon. I just love it. Well, let's see. Oh, I'm missing something. Yes, I, I agree. Whatever works for you personally, no doubt. And there's another thing. I, I, I want to show you these guys. I want to show you guys this too. This is another thing I'm going to do too going forward. Where is it? Glucose, glucose clearance. I'm also going to do this. I know, I, I know, because, you know, um, I talked about this in the past, the apple cider vinegar. I'm probably going to do the apple cider vinegar too. To a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. I do this on and off. I was doing this for years because apple cider vinegar has acidic acid in it, which helps clear glucose as well. So, like for example, if you do a tablespoon or two, I'm going to do one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar before, directly after a meal. It kind of slows the digestive process. Some people feel, and it helps control blood sugar post meal. So I may do that. I'm probably going to do that. Another thing, cinnamon is also another glucose clearing agent to some degree. It helps clear glucose. Another good thing to do. And I also may fool around with a little berberine. In the past, see, berberine really works at the same mechanism as metformin, really great for clearing glucose. When I would, In the past, when I've taken berberine, I would only do it on when I'm doing a cheat meal. Like if I'm going to go out and I'm going to really have a cheat meal and I know I'm going to get like a crazy blood glucose spike, I may take a couple of these berberine um, tablets. It's just like a plant. It helps control blood sugar. But I may start regularly doing it now. Um, Either with maybe do one one tablet for lunch, one capsule for dinner, to help control blood sugar. In addition, but I don't want to overdo it. But I may, I may fool around with that. I've been I've been looking at the berberine. It's really incredible, really affordable supplement. A lot of those guys, I know Andrew Huberman likes it. You have to be careful with it though. A lot of keto people like to take it like on an empty stomach because it really lowers blood sugar. But you can get like a splitting headache. I did that once and I got like a splitting headache. I think my blood sugar went too low. So don't, I wouldn't do it like that. I'd be careful with it. You know, check with your doctor. I shouldn't be talking about, you know, check with your doctor about berberine a little bit too to see what they think about it or any, what whoever your health provider is. But these are all like good glu- glucose clearing agent. Also balsamic vinegar works similar to apple cider vinegar because it's really the acidic acid. I mean, there is some, some people feel there's a benefit to the mother you know, of the apple cider vinegar and there's some other benefits to it. But when it comes to like the glucose and controlling glucose or clearing glucose, it's really the acidic acid that helps doing it. So for example, if I'm doing one of those salads, I probably should keep the balsamic vinegar on the salad because that's going to help me control blood sugar post meal. All right, so that's it. That's the plan for the next eight weeks. So I'm going to be in a calorie restricted state. I'm going to do a 16, 8, 18, 6. I'm going to use that. Um, if anyone missed it, let me pull that slide up because I really do like this zero. I'm going to use the zero app. And it's right on the phone. That's going to dictate when I'm going to have my first meal the next day, when I'm going to break my fast. So whenever I f- have my last meal for the day, if, I, if I'm done eating at like 9.30 one night, I hit that app. That means I'm not eating the next day until for at least 16 hours, which is 1.30, which may indicate that I might be working out faster that day if I work out at 12. If, if it doesn't go that way, if I'm done eating at 6 o'clock and I can probably have my first meal at 12, I mean, I'm working out at 12.30, I may do like a protein shake. So that's what's going to determine whether I'm working out fasted or not fasted. And I, I find this, this your app fun. I think you guys would like it. So de- definitely check it out. It's free. I, th- I definitely think you might um, you might really like it. Because Dad uses apple cider vinegar with water early morning to reduce LDL. You know, it, it's I, I've, had, I've had a number of people reduced LDL and it reduces LDL I think because um your LDLs go up when you're eating too many carbohydrates right so more than fat and all that fat too but more, you know more I, I I think you can control cholesterol by reducing carbohydrates more than just about anything else like the processed food or the fats and carbs combined that's the worst like the processed food cookie cakes and stuff like that but yes if you can control blood sugar you're gonna um also help your cholesterol for sure so I think there's definitely something to apple cider vinegar all right, so any other questions? 
Any other questions? So an hour and a half, this is perfect. I think two hours was too long last time. I don't want to start boring people. But I'm going to, so then that's what we're doing. The new schedule is we're doing every Sunday now, 11 o'clock. You know, if people start dropping off, <laughs> then I'll stop doing that. And once again, you know, give this video, get this live stream a thumbs up, share with anybody. And also, I think everyone here likes, um, I like doing the videos about like what I'm eating every day. I think they're kind of fun. They're easy to make too, which I kind of like. But I'm going to start, I have to do, I haven't done like a real high produced video in a while in my studio where I am now. So I'm going to try to do one of those this week. So any topics you want me to cover, let me know. You know, I really want to get, get to like 20,000 subs. That's what I heard. I heard once you get to 20,000 subs, then the algorithm really starts looking at you, you know, which is great. Let's see if we get another question. It worked for my dad. Went, well, that's a, that, that's a big improvement. 175 down to 149 in four months, just from the apple cider vinegar. It's pretty cool. I think it's great. I know I had a buddy of mine too in California who he took um, apple cider vinegar, really helped him lower his cholesterol too. I think he took niacin too with it, which it really helped as well. No Russian niacin I think helps as well too. All right, so any other questions before I go? I hope everyone's having a wonderful Memorial Day. You know, this is great. I really appreciate everyone showing up. This is great. I'm gonna go take my fasted walk now. And I, I know I'm getting together with my brother I know my nephew, he's such a good boy. Um, Jonathan graduated uh, college, you know, last week, which is great. So we're going to do some type of get get together, I hope, either today or tomorrow or something. We're going to do something, I hope. I hope to see everyone. All right, well, have a wonderful day. I'll give everyone one more minute before I go, if there's, in case any last question comes in. But there, um, I wish, oh, thank, thanks for the great walk. I appreciate it. All right, guys, take care. Have a wonderful day. I appreciate all you do. Oh, thanks, Deb. But thanks for the super chat, too. I mean, oh, that funny emoji. I really appreciate it. That's great. Followed. Oh, yeah, thanks for following me. I really appreciate it. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful day, and, and I'll see you guys next. I'll see you next Sunday. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.